All right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have time to cover the expected the last third of the uh, third lecture yesterday. So um, I unfortunately there's absolutely no time to cover what I planned as the original fourth lecture, which was supposed to be the quick review of the uh, paper from last year by Guy Yoto Kapus and Komar Gotsky and Zyberg. So I decided to talk about something different, which can be contained in one hour. So it will be, again, just a bit of a new light on the construction, from well-known construction from, from the 80s. <laughs> so in the end, I will end up talking just about things known in the 80s. But uh, let me try. So, so let's, say, let's consider a 2D QFT uh, with Z2 symmetry non-anomalous. So yesterday, I mean, in the second lecture, I explained that in 2D, um, you can have anomalous and non-anomalous Z2 symmetry. So let's take non-anomalous one. So let's call this theory Q, right? So what does the theory look like on in a circle? So because you have Z2 symmetry, you can either have untwisted sector and also twisted sector, right? By twisted sector, you, what happens is that you have non-trivial background Z2, right? So, so in the notation I was using yesterday, you have some domain wall uh, implementing this non-trivial Z2 operation. So the Hilbert space in this un untwisted case, Q untwisted, splits into two sectors, H plus, and H minus, sorry, H minus Q untwisted. Also, the twisted sector splits into two. Uh, twisted, HQ, and twist, uh, twisted. Where this plus minus sign just says that uh, this Z2 symmetry act, acts by plus one on this sector and minus one on the other sector, and similarly by plus one on this sector and minus one on the other sector, right? So that's, this is an extremely standard thing. So now we are assuming that this Z, Z2 symmetry is non-anomalous, so you can, we can gauge uh, this Z2, which is usually called in the um, string theory community by the orbifold. Or be folding. So this is the same word. So this, let's gauge this Z2 or all before this Z2. So what would be the Hilbert space of the all before the theory? So let's say let's denote this all before the theory by Q divided by Z2 because we are gauging the Z2. Then as you know, um, the all before the theory consists of gauge invariant states, right? So gauge invariant states of consists of this part and the other part. So this is Q untwisted plus and uh, Q uh, twisted plus. So this is the action of the all folding at the level of the Hilbert space. And it is known, I mean, you, you can easily see that you can try to implement, there is new Z2 symmetry here, which assigns a charge plus one for the states which came from the original untwisted state, and you assign charge minus one to the states which came from the original twisted state. So it's a, this is a very standard thing. 
And uh, so in some sense, this is the untwisted sector of the gauged theory. And in fact, you can introduce the twisted sector of the gauged theory, I mean, twisted by this new Z2 symmetry. And it is very natural to assign uh, this negative gauge invariant, sorry, gauge dependent part of the original theory. So you see that the situation here and there are kind of symmetric. So what happens is that you can take the, you can gauge or orbifold the new Z2, and you can reproduce the original ungaged theory. So very schematically, you can say that Q gauged by this Z2, gauged by the new Z2, and this becomes the original theory. So this fact was noticed uh, originally in the string theory community in 1989 by Wafa. So there's a paper called Quantum Symmetries. Dot, dot, dot. Um, so, I mean, quantum symmetry in Wafa's paper means just this additional Z2 symmetry, which assigns Z2 to the twisted sector, uh, in the case of Z2 orbifold. In general, if you perform Zn orbifolding, you just assign a Z, I mean, Zn twisted sector, that's dual Z, Zn charge. So this is a very um, general construction. So I'm s still talking about things in the 80s, right? But in fact, this co same construction has been known to physicists since uh, 1941. Can anybody guess which paper I'm going to refer to? So this is by Kramer Sandwani. Eh? Uh, where they first understood the duality operation of the Ising model. So let me explain why this operation is exactly what uh, Kramaswani did. So, well, I'm not going to review for you the detail of the Kramaswani duality transformation of the Ising model, but the important point is that Ising model as a 2D lattice model is given by, I mean, spin variables at each lattice point uh, with, the, with the action which is given, just given by, I mean, sum of this form, right? So you, you sum over all spin configurations, sum over the bonds and weight them by a temperature factor. So what was the kramer swanye transformation? What they did was to in consider in, on the dual lattice some dual variables. So let me use some colored chalk. So they introduced dual variables. What are these dual variables? What happened was that when dual variables, the dual variable sigma twiddle, if it is non-trivial, what happened was that this was an endpoint of uh, a domain wall separating, I mean, bl black region and the white region, right? So this means that you have some a jump which connects plus original variable plus one and original variable minus one. So what this does is really the domain wall of this domain wall of this original Z2 symmetry and because this domain wall ends on this disorder field, I mean disorder variable, this is I mean, the end point of this domain wall, which, I mean, if you go to the conformal point, correspond to the twisted sector field, right? 
So this is a twisted sector field. Therefore, the dual Ising model at dual temperature was in fact obtained by gauging this uh, Z2 symmetry of the Ising model and right so the un so this disorder variable lives in the untwisted sector of the dual Ising model but this came from the twisted sector of the original theory um, in fact um, there's a direct way to perform this Kramer's one year transformation of the Ising model and if you, you remember that that involves uh, plus minus one variable living on the bonds and you sum over it. So this plus minus one variable living on the bonds are in fact lattice ga Z2 gauge field you are adding and gauging it. So you can re review once you go back to your home institution the standard operation of crown mass and one year and that's, this is exactly it. So Ising model is a rather peculiar example of this operation I should emphasize. Because if you start from Ising model at temperature beta, I mean inverse temperature beta, and perform this Z2 gauging, you get the same Ising model with just different parameter, I mean the dual temperature. This doesn't usually happen, right? I mean, typically, this theory and the gauge theory are totally different. But Ising model has this pe peculiar property that it is mapped to itself. Uh, so that's, that's one point. So let me view this construction in a slightly different way. Ah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I only discussed how this Z2 orbifolding acts at the level of the Hilbert space. So let's see how it acts at the level of the partition function, right? So the original theory is Q, right? And let's say this Q is put on a Riemann surface, I mean, two-dimensional surface sigma. Therefore, you have some partition function, Q. So I don't write sigma explicitly, but I'd like to make explicit the dependence on the background Z2 gauge field V, where V is an element, right? So this V is just background. Uh, thank you very much. Z2 gauge field. So the standard thing we say is that, I mean, the partition function of the dual theory is obtained by summing over all possible background gauge field. So this is the path integral over the Z2 gauge field. Usually path integral involves integration over infinite dimensional manifold, so that's very hard. But for Z2 gauge fields, the number of configuration is just finite, so it's a just finite sum. So it's very well defined, easy to understand. And uh, if you are very careful, you need to, of course, put the normalization factor so that it transforms correctly. But uh, in view of time, I would be sloppy about the overall factor, but they can be filled in. Right? But this doesn't tell you the dependence of the dual, sorry, the orbifold theory to the dual Z2 gauge field, right? Because we now know that this theory has new Z2 symmetry. Therefore, you are supposed to be able to couple to, can couple to, dual. Dual, dual background, right? So we should be able to, we should be able to write the partition function of the gauge theory under the dual background. So what's the formula? 
the formula is, in fact, very simple. You just sum over V, and uh, you just introduce an additional factor, V with W, and you just perform this summation, right? So here, what is going on is that we have elements in this cohomology group, and you have elements on the other cohomology group. So you take the product, which is in the H2 of sigma Z2, and you can integrate that over the surface. So this is a mod 2 number. And you just assign a phase accordingly. So this is uh, basically a discrete Fourier transformation, nothing more than that. So the inverse transformation is very simple. I mean, it's just the same formula with V and W replaced. Right? So far, so good. So what's so interesting about this? Well, not much, but uh, you can give it a three-dimensional interpretation. So let's go on to 3D interpretation. So what would you do? So the idea is the following. Let's say you have a 2D boundary and a 3D bulk, right? Let's put Z2 symmetric theory here, right? And as I discussed in the last lectures, um, the anomaly of this theory is accounted for by the bulk SPT theory. However, I was emphasizing that here I'm talking about non-anomalous theory, so we don't have to attach the SPT, but we can still attach a completely trivial theory, completely empty theory, Z2 symmetric theory. Why would you want to do that, right? This is a totally stupid operation. Now you gauge the entire setup. Right? So what happens is that you now have Q attached to a boundary, but you now have in the bulk a, a 3D um, Z2 gauge theory. I don't know how many of you know the behavior of the 3D gauge theory, so let me quickly review it for you. I mean, in any case, we started from the bulk theory, which is really complete trivial without anything, and we are just summing over discrete degrees of freedom. The, mo the most we can get is some topological theory. So this is, in fact, known to be a topological 3D TQFT. And in fact, this is known to be equivalent to U1 squared chan simons theory with level matrix 0 to, to 0. Or equivalently, it's, it just has the action 1 over pi over ADB, where A and B are two U1 field. So this might already be surprising to some of you that, that mere Z2 gauge theory is equivalent to a Chan Simons theory, but that's true. So um, let me explain to you what kind of line operators does it have, right? So from this point of view, there's a Wilson line with various charges for both A and B, right? But uh, let's use this Z2 gauge theory description. Um, so, of course, you can have a Wilson line for non-trivial Z2 charge, right? Z2 There's only one non-trivial Z2 representation, so you can consider Wilson line in that representation. And dually, you can construct Tohuft line for this Z2. So we, it is common to denote it as M. So what happens is that um, because this is a Tohuft line, if you have Wilson line wrapped around it, and if you pull this Wilson line out, you get an extra minus one 
as this sign. Um, in this Chen Simon's description, uh, you can check that uh, one, I mean, electric Wilson line comes from the Wilson line of A, of order charge, and uh, electric Wilson line for B with the order charge just gives you this Tohut uh, line. So this is, this is it. So why is it interesting to consider this system? So the funny thing is that we started from the Wilson, I mean, Wilson line, or gate, Z2 symmetry associated to E. However, once you gauge it, you have another line operator, which is labeled by N, magnetic line operator, but you see that the role played by E and M are completely the same, completely symmetric, right? So what this means is that what this means is that if you instead start Thank you. Yeah, I can, I think I can just yeah. write on that. So what happens is that suppose you have original symmetry Z to E, right? And in the bulk, we have this line labeled by E and line labeled by M. However, you can repeat the same construction starting from another different Z2 this time associated from the line M, right? But then once you gauge the bulk, so originally we are considering the bulk Z2E gauge theory. But if you consider the bulk Z2M gauge theory, this also has electric line operator associated to Z to M with Tohuft operator, now labeled by E, but they are in fact the same theory, right? So this is a funny fact. We now have a Z2 gauge theory, but realized in two different ways. So you can consider the following thing. You now have a segment Oh, so this is a Z2 gauge theory. Right? On this side, on, on this side of the boundary, you can put Dirichlet boundary condition for Z to E. Right? On the other side, you can consider Dirichlet for Z to M. Right? So what, so what do you, what happens? So the operation I'm going to do is to uh, place this two-dimensional theory, Q, on one end. So originally Q had Z2 E symmetry, so you can couple it here, and you can gauge it, gauge it. So, Z2 E symmetry goes away. However, you now have new Z2 M symmetry coming out. You can check that this entire system, in fact, has, in fact, is just Q over Z2, I explained. So this construction might be, sound very familiar to some of you in the supersymmetric community. Uh, Gaiotto and Witten considered S duality in N equals for super young males, and constructed the S-duality wall theory, usually called TSUN. So in that case, the same N equals for super young males has a two-dual description um, obtained from electric SUN and magnetic SUN. Therefore, you can consider a wall like this, which has directly boundary conditions for the electric SUN, and the Dirichlet boundary condition of the magnetic SUN, so that if you glue that to some three-dimensional theory, you get a S-dual theory. So that's a very nice construction, which is very rich. 
Here I'm just discussing an extremely toy version of this duality wall associated to topological gauge theory. So let me show that this indeed gives you the right transformation rule. Um, so how, how do we analyze that? So let's say that you have sigma and you have a bulk direction. So this 3D gauge theory, which is a topological theory, should associate a Hilbert space, H sigma, right? Please don't confuse this with the Hilbert space of the two-dimensional theory Q. So this is an auxiliary thing in some sense. So this is the standard TQFT Hilbert space, and on this, there are various operators acting on it. For example, let's say you have a low line A, so, so let's pick an element A from the homology, Z2 valued homology, uh, Z2, and say you want to label it with the Wilson line operator E. So this gives you an operator I denote by LE of A. So this just means the Wilson line wrapping around the cycle A for the Wilson line, and similarly, I can consider a magnetic Wilson line operators, right? So let's say you put a Dirichlet boundary condition. Dirichlet for Z to E given by element V in H1 sigma Z2. Ah, I'm going to identify H, I mean, homology H1 and homology H1 just by the intersection pairing and Poincare duality. But what happens is that, I mean, if you specify a Dirichlet condition here, that should create a state for the 3D theory, right? So let's denote the corresponding state as this. Uh, I mean, this is an electric Dirichlet condition specified by this background value. And of course, uh, in this basis, these electric Wilson lines have uh, simultaneous eigenvalues, which is just given by A which V integrated, right? So this is it. And uh, another thing is that these two things satisfy the commutation relation. Uh, minus one to this pairing, right? So you, what you do is to in, introduce a simultaneous eigenstate for the magnetic operators too, which is given by B which W, M, W, and well, because of this, again, this is just a discrete Fourier transformation or discrete Heisenberg group. So from this, you can compute that the inner product itself is just given by minus one integrated, right? So this means that uh, this setup really just gives you the uh, amplitudes, sorry, partition function I just said because of the following. So let me just erase here and just draw that partition function. So what happens is that at this point, this theory, original theory, creates some, this is some number, right? And because of the Dirichlet condition, you have, I mean, this state associated to electric charge. But then on the other side, we are using the state which diagonalizes the magnetic Wilson loops. So this is the, and here we are gazing the Z2, so we are summing over V. So the, the partition function of the entire system, I just described from the 3D point of view, is this, but if you plug in this standard uh, S matrix of the three-dimensional TQFT, you get the, exactly the formula I showed, right? So well, that's the fun thing you can do with the three-dimensional uh, construction. So let me go on to the n 
next case, which might be a bit more interesting. Now let me come to the another construction. So I sh I'm still going to talk about this bulk 3D theory. So I said that there's this line operator E and line operator N with this important relation that if you reorder them, you get the minus sign, right? So now let's consider a, a new line operator here, which is consisting of a line operator E and line operator M placed parallel, right? Let's now twist this line operator by 2 pi, what would happen? So what happens is that uh, it's kind of hard to draw, but because of the twisting, once you rotate this 2 pi, you generate two crossing points, right? So, but in order to compare this and that, you need to, for example, perform the braiding at the junction upside. So this gives you uh, this, right? But now you can separate, I mean, put them in the opposite um, original position. So this means that this combination of operator E and M placed parallelly behaves like a fermion because a two pi rotation gave you the minus one sign. So you, we, from now on, let's denote the combination as F, right? So let's see. So, so far, we introduced the basis which diagonalizes diagonalizes uh, 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 L E A's and uh, M W, which diagonalizes L M A's, right? But we can consider basis which diagonalizes this ferromunic operator. So this should diagonalize L F A, which I just defined to be L E A times L M A, right? So what is this third Z2 like object? So, there is one interesting thing going on here. So, I didn't carefully explain, but uh, I mean, these operators behave naturally under the addition. Right? I mean, electric Wilson line wrapped on a cycle A times electric Wilson line wrapped on cycle B is just electric operator wrapped on A plus B. Why not? The same is true for L LM. However, if you compute LF and LFB, then this is almost, almost A plus B, but with an additional factor. A wedge B. This can be easily checked by from this definition because you need to exchange LM and LE once. But this is, in fact, exactly what's necessary to describe a spin, a spin structure. So let me explain why that's the case. It can be seen in a very easy example.
So, I mean, everybody knows that MS sector is more ordinary, right? And R sector is somewhat weird, right? Well, R sector is periodic, but it's definitely more weirder than NS sector. So I would like to assign plus one to the NS sector as the eigenvalue of this thing, and R sector to be minus one. I, I, right? So let's see what happens in the case of the standard torus. Right? So let's say both directions is in the R spin structure, then, so let's call this direction A, and let's call this direction B. In this case, we would like LF of A to be minus one, because it's the weird R sector, and LF of B to be in the R sector, so it's minus one. But however, uh, we also want the diagonal direction also have R sector, so this should be minus one too. So in order to account for this, uh, Additional minus one, you need to input this factor. This is given by the intersection product of A and B. So this means that these, these operator LF can be diagonalized by specifying a spin structure. Right? Which is kind of obvious because of the fact that this operator F is a fermion. In order to evaluate the fermionic line operator, you need a spin structure. So, um, so let's say that in the spin structure sigma, this is a plus, mi plus one minus one when this is NS sector, this is R sector. So this is the definition of the symbol sigma A, which pairs a spin structure and uh, A. Uh, cycle, and then what this means is that uh, if you evaluate LFA in F sigma, you get minus one to sigma A uh, F sigma. So this is a simultaneous eigenstate. And furthermore, this sigma A satisfies an important equation that sigma A plus sigma B. This is almost a linear function but with a correction term, which is given by A H B, mod 2. So various features of this funny function is explained in a nice paper by Atiyah from 1971. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm talking about extremely old stuff all day. But this allows us to do a funny thing. Come down. So let me reuse this picture, right? Here, when we performed the Z2 OB folding, or, the, or equivalently, I think, yeah, or equivalently, the Kramas Warnier transformation, I used uh, Dirichlet condition for Z2E on one side and Dirichlet condition for Z2M. Now, let me use instead this state, right? This is in some sense a Dirichlet condition for spin structure, right? The point is that uh, here I said that if you start from a trivial bulk theory and gauge it, if you start from a trivial Z2M SPT and gauge it, you get the same Z2 gauge theory. But in fact, there's a third corner there's a third corner in the construction. Uh, third corner in the construction, which is, I mean, equal to, I mean, equal to the following fact. So suppose you have a spin theory. So th there's no Z2 symmetry. This theory uh, couples to spin structure. So this field's spin structure. And you have trivial spin uh, 3D theory, 3D SPT. 
So it's just very trivial. You just assign whatever spin structure, and the partition function is always one. Now you gauge this spin structure, or equivalently, sum over the spin structure, right? Then you get 3D spin structure gauge theory instead of Z2 gauge theory. Right? What is this weird object? What I have been explaining in this lecture is that this bulk theory is the same as this theory. So the bulk theory always have three types of non-trivial operator, E or M or F. Um, this comes from putting Dirichlet condition for E. This corner comes from putting Dirichlet conditions for M. The last part comes from putting Dirichlet conditions for F. So they are totally equivalent. But now this allows us to transform by this same setup uh, the following construction. So let's say Q is a Z2 symmetric theory, right? And therefore, you have this partition function depending on the gauge, Z2 gauge field. Now you put it on the boundary with the Dirichlet condition for E, right? And you have this segment or slab of 3D gauge theory, and you have a Dirichlet condition for the spin structure. So you put F sigma, right? And then you gauge this Z2 symmetry to merge the system. Right? This is now a theory which depends on the spin structure magically. Right? So this way you can construct a theory which magically feels spin structure from any theory which is Z2 symmetric. If you apply this operation to Ising model, what you get is the majorana and Fermion theory. So this operation is the generalization of jordan wigner transformation, right? So jordan wigner transformation rewrites the spin variable sigma i at each lattice point in terms of the majorana and Fermion variables. So this is the generalization. Of course, you can do the opposite construction, right? By, I mean, concat I mean, putting the spin theory on this side and regarding that theory as a Z2 symmetric theory. So this is just the opposite uh, operation, which just means that Q sigma, uh, sigma, and uh, uh, EV, which is the original theory, right? But, so in, on this side, what I did is to start from a theory which depends on the spin structure and add some phase. I mean, this phase is just, I forgot to write that this phase, let me, this phase is just this minus one to sigma, sigma v, right? So this is just plus minus one. And I got a theory which is, depends on Z2. This might be a bit too confusing, so let me just write down the case when when, when uh, V is zero, what do you get? Z cube with V is zero is just the summation over the spin structure of the spin theory. This is exactly the ZSO projection. This is a non-chiral ZSO projection, right? So this is the gliotti shirk olive projection. But we now learned that, ah, but before, and uh, so if the, the gauge field is non-trivial, it's just a sum over the spin structure, right? And you can insert the 
Z2 gauge field. This means that the summed over theory has Z2 symmetry. This Z2 symmetry just assigns all the Z2 charge to whatever thing which came from the R sector. So NS sector is assigned even charge, and R sector is just given all the charge. So that's the obvious Z2 symmetry. But the interesting thing we learned right now is that these top two operations are opposite, I mean, inverse of each other, right? Have you ever heard that jordan Wigner transformation and GSO transformation are inverse to each other? You just learned that, right? So that's a new, in, new insight you get by studying this topological a relation between topological phases in one higher dimensions. So I still have one minute, sorry, one, five minutes. So I can, a bit more. Right. So let me discuss a bit more operations. Right. So yesterday, I said that, in fact, there are two ways to perform GSO projection, right? I only discussed one way to do the GSO projection. So what is that? Why is that? Why is that? So let's say we have a spin two-dimensional surface with a given spin structure, right? And everybody who did a bit of string theory knows that if you assign R sector, R boundary condition for both cycles, things are a bit strange. While if you have any other combination of structures, they are somewhat more normal, right? So this is called even spin structure. And this is called odd spin structure, right? So mathematicians define a certain function called arf invariant. Arf is the name of a person such that this is plus one and minus one, sorry, zero or one, when sigma is even or sigma is odd, right? So there's a two-dimensional theory, arf, so this is a 2D spin SPT. But this is a very trivial theory. The partition function of this theory half on sigma is really just a phase, right? So simple. So this gives you plus one for even spin structure and minus one for the odd spin structure. So there are two ways to perform a GSO projection. One is to just sum over the spin structure, right? So this is the zero A uh, GSO projection. You can also think perform the GSO projection with an extra phase for the odd spin structure. So these are the two uh, GSO projections, but there's a more better way to think about this second operation, because as I said, this sign is not just a random sign, but it's in fact a partition function of a very trivial theory. So we use this as the partition function of the R half invariant, right? So this is just the partition function of the combined theory, original theory, with the half theory. Right? 
So now I'm thinking of multiplying by this trivial theory as some kind of operation on the space of 2D theories. So now I'm coming to the most interesting part of this rather trivial exercises. Uh, rather trivial exercises. So let me remind you the various operations we've been learning so far today. So I was talking about set of 2D spin QFTs, right? And also set of 2D Q non-spin QFTs with non-anomalous Z2 symmetry, right? And I discussed Jordan Wigner transformation. So this sends Q to, let's say, Jordan Wigner Q, right? On the other hand, if you have a theory here, we can bar from GSO projection to get GSO projection of Q. And these two are inverse operations, right? We also discussed the operation called kramas warnier transformation, right? So this sends Q to kramas warnier Q, which is just Z2 orbifolding, right? Which acted within the set of 2D QFTs with a Z2 symmetry. And I just discussed a very stupid operation of multiplying by the ARF theory. I mean, ARF theory has partition function plus minus one. Therefore, if you multiply two copies of ARF theory to a theory, it just vanishes. It's a completely trivial theory, right? So what I want to show as the last step is the following. In fact, this Z2 gauging and the multiplication by the ARF invariant is exchanged under this Jordan Wigner and GSO operations. So as an equation, performing this kramas warnier transformation is in fact equivalent with doing GSO projection after multiplying by the ARF invariant of the jordan Wigner transformation of the original theory, right? So this is totally trivial operation if you work out the details, but if you state it in this way, fancy way, this looks like something nice. So, <laughs> so let me show you why this is the case. So, but the computation just boils down to the following. So this GSO part is just given by W, WE, right? And this FV, sorry, F sigma. And you have the ARF invariant, ARF invariant of sigma. And then you have sigma F and uh, EV, right? And you need to sum over sigma. So you just have to do the computation of this equation. So this is just sigma minus one to uh, sigma w plus half sigma plus sigma v. So to compute, um, you need to use some formula relating these things. So I just told you that sigma w and sigma v can be replaced by sigma w plus v plus w wedge v, right? So this is first step. The next step is the formula about the ARF invariant 
which says that alpha invariant of sigma plus a is alpha invariant of sigma plus sigma a. Um, so if you have a spin structure and a Z2 gauge field, you can have a new spin structure, right? So what's the evenness or oddness of the new spin structure? It's given by just this shift. So that's the formula. So this can be now replaced by half sigma plus V plus W, right? So the end result is that you have this factor and that part and summed over sigma. However, in any case, you are summing over sigma. So this shift by V plus W doesn't matter. So this is just proportional to minus one, two, V wedge W, which is exactly the standard uh, discrete Fourier transformation. Right, so I think this kind of analysis is fun because we are now operating not at the level of equations of numbers, but rather as an equation acting on the set of quantum field theories. So that's kind of a meta operation we are doing right now. Um, so this is an extremely simple type of such operation, but uh, you feel that, that something is going on. So let me finish with a, one final remark about the Ising model. So as I said, Ising model is special. Ising beta is the Ising model of the original, I mean, dual temperature, right? This is a special feature about this Ising model. This means that if you go to the spin side by this transformation, what, what happens is the Majorana fermion theory, if you multiply by the half invariant theory, this is in fact the same Majorana fermion theory. Well, I haven't carefully kept track of how this beta, I mean temperature maps, but the known result is that temperature is mapped to the mass of the Majorana fermion, and the dual theory maps to the Majorana fermion with negative mass term, right? Because at self-dual temperature, mass is zero, it becoming massless that gives you the 2D Ising CFT. So you have deformation of the mass from the, to the positive side and the negative side that correspond to the ordered phase and the disordered phase, which are supposed to be exchanged by the uh, Z2 gauging operation. So this should be the case, right? But why, why is it? So this can be understood by considering the, again, the case of the torus, right? So let's put R, let's compare two cases with both R periodic boundary conditions or both NS boundary conditions. What happens is, is the following. You see, uh, Lagrangian of this Majorana fermion theory is extremely simple. You just have the kinetic term for the left movers, kinetic term for the right movers, and the mass term, right? So this is it. But the point is, on the torus, there's one zero mode for psi L and psi R. And on the torus, there's no, no zero modes, right? So in order to write down the partition function, you need to absorb the fermion zero modes. This means that on the, on the R sector side, I mean, this is the old spin structure case. This comes with old power of M, but this comes with even power of M if you compute the partition function. Therefore, multiplying by the alpha invariant, you just switch M to minus M, right? So that's 
that explains why that happens. So what is going on is that uh, in this theory, you have chiral, chiral Z2 symmetry, right? But this chiral Z2 symmetry has an anomaly on the odd spin structure because this operator is odd under the chiral Z2 symmetry. So the end result is that if the chiral Z2 symmetry has a mixed anomaly with spin structure. So let's start from such a spin theory which has a chiral Z2 symmetry, which has a mixed anomaly with the spin structure, and perform the GSO projection. Then, just as in the case of Ising model, you automatically get a self-dual theory under this cooler mass one-year transformation. So that's how these old results about two-dimensional quantum field theory can be slightly better understood using 3D TQFT. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> um, so all these things are explained in a vague way in various papers by Kapustin and Gaiotos. But this is a really the simplest case, right? And uh, th these gentlemen who wrote those papers are more interested in uh, higher dimensional systems, right? So as a uh, Warm up of these higher dimensional constructions, they have a few paragraphs <laughs> about exactly what I told you. So, um, yeah. So, I don't think there's any nice reference where this thing is explained using 60 minutes. So, <laughs> um, well, at least I will scan this lecture note and put it on the web page, but I'm not sure whether I would type it or not. If everybody forces me. Yes? Hmm? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, may maybe, maybe I should then, right. Um, yeah, but this is really all the stuff, right? Just viewed in a new way, so. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> Maybe everyone is hungry. Well, then, thank you. Uh, ah. Okay. Ah. Yes, it's related. Yes. Now, obviously, you're dealing with this big uh, mm -hmm. Um. Yes, um, so that's a case where you have a mixed anomaly between the um, fermion number and the uh, background I don't, uh, isospin symmetry. Yeah, but, so by introducing a non-trivial background for the isospin symmetry, you get fractional charge. Yeah. And the, and the magnetic field also plays a critical role. That's right, yeah. So I can rephrase the content in that paper in this <laughs> language too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.